ESPN celebrating 150 years of college football. What about the game of football? How has it changed? Has it changed an awful lot through the years? College football has always been a great place for innovation. A long pass and a terrific diving catch into the end zone. You talk about evolution in my lifetime of this game. Just think about it. We've seen so many evolutions of offense and defense. There's some of the variety of the wishbone attack. Nowadays, they're throwing the ball all over the field. A lot of points scored now. It's more entertaining now. Rodgers has it! The Aggies have prevailed! The game has changed so much the talent. The kids are so much better today. They're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. It's vicious. You know, there's a reason they park the ambulance outside the stadium before the game starts. That is targeting. He's got to come out. We know a bit more about ourselves by looking back and seeing, OK, what was the development of American football about? Why did this fresh young country come jumping up out of the mud and create this game of collision? College football is more than the tusslings among two dozen boys on Saturday afternoon. It's getting knocked down. It's getting right back up. And these are the sort of things that make boys men. In the clear, and scores! Game presented by Cintas. When you're talking about something that starts 150 years ago, you're dealing with ideas that are impossible to prove, but there is this belief now, or at least this mythology, that one of the reasons college football became this central part of America was that after the Civil War, people had this fear that young men would now have nothing to prepare themselves to face adversity and deal with hardship, and that it would weaken the republic if we didn't put them through something like a war. All night fight, baby, 60 minutes. Now it's kind of become unpopular to make that comparison seen as sort of a troubling thing, but since we couldn't just start a war, they created this idea of college football and had these kids play college football to prepare them for life. The thing that is most distinctive about American football is it began as a college sport, unlike baseball. Football had been around for centuries as just kind of a rough and tumble kicking game, you know, just kick a ball across a field, sometimes guild against guild or village against village. Mob football was played, in which was one village versus another village. You know, they had a pig's bladder and you had to get the pig's bladder from that church over to the other church. That was the object of the game without murdering anybody. Usually rule number one in mob football was no manslaughter. That was the rule, which is, I guess, comforting. We always say that the first college football game was in 1869 between Princeton and Rutgers, but the first American intercollegiate game was not a game of actual American football, it was a game of soccer. The shape of the football used during the first college game played between Rutgers and Princeton looked like this. Fat and well-rounded. They played this game, and it was two teams, 25 men each, and it was a game where no one got to run with the ball. It was strictly a kicking game, and you could bat it with your head like they do in soccer, or you could even punch the ball. And the first team that gets six goals was the winner. And so that was how the sport began. The colleges were places where the informal football game was played. You can't just play football spontaneously. You need some sort of group of kids to do it. And it was barely tolerated by the faculties and administrators at these schools. Elliot at Harvard would have been happy to see the game banned because he saw no reason for his bright young scholars to go out there and smash their brains in. This is Harvard, a mighty symbol of America's faith in education. In 1873, all the schools that played football got together and formed this codified set of rules. And everybody preferred the kicking game except for Harvard, which preferred the running game. Now watch a dying screen card. And a few years later, their enthusiasm for this rugby-type game spread to the other schools. 
and the other schools ended up all adopting this rugby type of a game. In the early days, the first decade of football, as we think of it, it was just the swarm of bodies moving back and forth. A lot of physical injury, a lot of mayhem within the swarm, but there was really no lines of demarcation between the two teams. It was just moving back and forth, trying to advance this ball. Walter Camp's a player at Yale, and he hated the randomness of the scrum, and so he wanted one team to have control of the ball. So in 1880, he got everybody to agree on this scrimmage rule. The teams are separated by the scrimmage line. Camp was just trying to put some order into putting the ball in play without intending to do so. You transformed rugby football into a collision sport. You separate those two sides, and they're going to start colliding with each other, you know? Princeton figured out in playing Yale that if they never gave up the ball, they couldn't lose. And so they just held on to the ball for an entire half. And it was boring and wasn't a game at all. And so they had to come up with this other rule, the down and distance rule. This is in, in 1882, where if the team didn't advance the ball in three attempts, they'd have to surrender the ball to the other team. So from that point on, you have what can become American football. The score is still Army nothing and Notre Dame nothing. And you only needed to gain five yards to gain a first down, not 10. So you didn't need to really have wide open plays. It was all tight formation football. And from what little film I've seen of that type of a game, and it had to be really boring. I can't see it really exciting at all, because they're just plowing, you know, two, three, four yards down the field. People are getting hurt, and people are bloodied up, and people are getting head injuries and being carried off the field. From the flying wedge, ball would be snapped, and they would take the guy and throw him. And they would take the guy and throw another guy up, and they would meet in midair. That propulsion is not what the body was made out for, certainly not what the brain was made out for. To the gridiron now, an all too familiar ritual this high school football season, a vigil for a fallen player, this time 17-year-old Andre Smith, whose death is now attributed to a head injury during a game. Football has never been free of controversy of some sort or other since the very beginning. Over the violence and the mayhem that the rules allowed and even encouraged. They nearly banned it in Georgia when a kid died on the field. Only his mother begging the governor to not ban the game stopped them from banning it. Some schools dropped football along the way. All of these minor crises finally culminated in 1905. They talk about this crisis of 1905. Football is this harvest of death. No one really knows the exact number, I think, but the number they often use is 20 players died that year. People are dying. You know, there's like multiple deaths on the field, and we get into that question of, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth it for these guys to be playing a game? This isn't war but the drive toward preserving manhood in some ways is what winds up saving it. Don't flinch, don't fall, and hit the line hard. A lot of people wanted to shut down the game, but Teddy Roosevelt thought it was the most brilliant game. He said it's a manly game. It teaches men to be men. Roosevelt worried a lot about the country going soft. He was trying to preserve American masculinity while not presiding over wholesale death of young men. Roosevelt summoned the leaders from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton to the White House and told them that if they don't do something about this, the public will demand abolition of the game. Roosevelt brings in Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and that is the genesis of the modern NCAA. The mission was simply to save the game. And how do you save the game? You save it, A, safety. You add helmets, shoulder pads, you change the rules, you get rid of the flying wedge. So it does work quite well. Now, the game has never been completely safe, and it never will be. You can't get rid of the violence. Football, of course, is a violent sport, but is it too violent? Every sport has risks, but hard hits are fundamental to football. 
and there's mounting evidence it's putting players at risk of brain damage. Until we discovered that brains are damaged by these blows, we always were able to console ourselves by saying that the costs of playing football are outweighed by the benefits. And so 1905-1906 was not the solution to football's problems, but one step in what became then a series of subsequent steps, always wrestling with the same problem, how to keep football rough, but not too rough. In the early days, when football was this new thing, there was no limit to the number of ideas that were still possible because not much had been attempted. Football is a conservative game, and yet within the constrictions of how it is played, it is the most progressive game because every new idea is worth attempting. As all day, loops it over the middle downfield into the end zone, broke it up, but a flag comes in. Pass right. interference, defense, number 13 all over his back, an easy call for the official. If the rules of the modern game seem really esoteric and confusing about how one may block and what you can and can't do above the waist, below the waist, it all emanates from the beginning of the game when it was pretty much anything was allowed and everything happened in close quarters and there were significant injuries because of that. Snap, handoff, Hill, got it. But a flag down. Offside, number 90, defense, lined up in the neutral zone. Here, you can see it. I mean, this is very clear. I mean, the neutral zone is right there. He is in it. William Henry Lewis was the first African-American, all-American football player. He played at Harvard. He remained at Harvard as an assistant coach. And he had the idea of creating the neutral zone. Yeah, there was a line of scrimmage, but the players on each side of the line of scrimmage would play nose to nose. The neutral zone provided separation between the two sides, and that allowed the offense a little wiggle room to get a play started, and the defense had to figure out how to stop it. Going deep, left sideline, man's there, he's got him, Jared! Think about what the game would be without the neutral zone. It would be chaotic, very physical play immediately. You know, we talk now about a quarterback being able to get the ball out in two or three seconds. And that's with about a foot of room to help the play develop. Davis going for Archie Fisher, touchdown. If we didn't have that, it would be much more difficult to move the ball. And part of the beauty of the game is watching the offense move the ball. Hogan with a lot of time sends one toward the end zone in a double coverage and it is caught for a touchdown. You can remember with the way we have such open offenses now there was one time you couldn't throw the ball beyond the line of scrimmage. It was just mano mano and run at each other and see what you can do. Most important rule change in college football, 1905, the advent of the forward pass. No question. Until then, it's basically rugby. And you're smashing up football, it's too dangerous. The forward pass. We can throw this thing. We can get from here to there a lot quicker than just pounding it out. Oh, I like three yards in a cloud of dust every now and then. But a forward pass is pretty cool. Now speed matters. It adds speed and skill, not just big and tough. You have to catch the damn thing. Big possession for Davidson. Big shot by Curry! Like basketball adding the three-point shot. It takes it away from the big men and allows the little guys to play, little fast guys. And that's what the four pass did. Throwing deep for Moss, and he's got it. Zantana Moss breaks a tackle. Forget it. He's gone. Touchdown, Hurricane. I could not imagine college football without the forward pass and just how it's used now and just the evolution of kind of passing-oriented schemes. Fourth and 18. Some creative type pass. Maybe it's a play like the one at the Auburn-Georgia game in 2013 where Auburn is down to their last down and a long way to go. Let's it go. That's what a miracle pass can create, whereas before it was just a much different looking game. The forward pass creates a dramatic moment in the game 
that makes it a thousand times more dynamic and more gripping and more uncertain and more popular than it ever would have been without the forward pass. To the end zone. June 6th, 1944, and the greatest armada in military history is assembled in England for an assault on Hitler's fortress Europe. The war changed the game in ways nobody really foresaw. They began to play two platoon football instead of one platoon, allowing 22 players to play. One platoon meant everyone played both ways. So the entire game was 60 minutes, 11 guys going at each other. We had to play both offense and you had to play defense. And if you were a 300 pound guy, you could not play college football very long because you would not be able to play 60 minutes. You'd be gassed. Until World War II, substitution rule was you can only substitute at the quarter or in the case of a serious injury. So not only did you play the game that way, you were ordered to play the game that way. In 1941, before Pearl Harbor, knowing that these guys are probably going to be going off to World War II at some point, they changed the rule quietly that you can now substitute at any time. And those three little words changed the game forever. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. After the war, some coaches figured out, oh, there are strategic advantages here. And so they started developing true to platoon football, but there was so much concern about that, you know, losing the Iron Man stamina that it took to play. In 1953, two platoon football was outlawed again, and so one platoons came back. Two platoons did not officially come back permanently until 1965. Now you can concentrate on just being a quarterback, just your passing ability. Where before, you also had to play defense. You had to be a safety. It also allowed specialization with the kicking game. It's good. USC wins it. You know, before, the kicker might have been a guard, or your left halfback, because you couldn't substitute him out because of the substitution rules at that time. Lacey Berger, quarter. Berger out. Good luck, Marty. The success of two platoon football was a combination of the appeal of the game and just the fact that the older coaches were no longer there to defend the sanctity of one platoon football. And in comes the jumbo package led by Christian Wilkins. Anybody who says, let's go back to the old days and play both ways, says, you will not watch that game because it'll be slower, it'll be smaller, the specialists are all gone. All that's driven by platoon football. And it's allowed defenses to become more diverse. It's allowed offenses to become more diverse. They hand it off to Johnson. Boise State has won. That really revolutionized the game, the advent of two platoon football. Can you believe it? Players' equipment has made some drastic changes since the beginning of football. To properly protect and equip players nowadays is tremendously important. Some of the earliest uniforms, a lot of jerseys actually had pads sewn into the shoulders and the elbows. The pants would use reeds in your thighs as a means of protection. But of course, the biggest deal was the shoulder pads. Before, it might just be a pad that laid on your shoulder, where now, you had what's known as a cantilever shoulder pad, kind of like a cantilever bridge. The pads were lifted above the shoulder, so they absorb the blow before it's transferred onto your actual shoulder itself. The uniform is like a suit. You put a suit on, but now what accessories do you add? The accessory becomes the helmet. Football headgears are made from plastic or leather and weigh 26 ounces. Well, the very first helmet was worn by a Navy player by the name of Reeves. He has like a shoemaker come up with his first helmet. And when you look at it, it looks like, like a beehive. It's kind of good, you know, the top. And the myth and the legend of this story is that the doctor said, if you get hit in the head one more time, it will cause instant insanity. <laughs> Bizarre medical diagnosis. 
But early on, most people really didn't wear a helmet. They wore these weird things called Morel nose mask, which is this hard rubber thing that had a strap around it and you held it in with your teeth. In an attempt to prevent fatal injuries in football, I have invented this new type football helmet, which I believe will do much to rid the game of fatalities. The inventor sure has faith in his helmet, for he's going to try it out himself. And now watch him take it. Right on the old beam. We developed a leather helmet, and the leather helmet did absolutely nothing. A leather helmet will not stop you getting a concussion. It's like my mother-in-law, isn't it? The first really revolutionary aspect of helmet design was the suspension helmet, where you had a series of straps and what have you that would be on your head and would cradle the helmet shell away from sitting directly on your skull. And so the thought was the shell would absorb all the blow. And so that became the standard for helmets until the mid-1980s. The modern helmet is light years different from what it was initially. And now the theory is, do they offer too much protection? Is it become a weapon rather than a means of defense? Personal foul, targeting, number 42. When you got your bell rung when I played, basically you shook it off. Just looked at it as you got your bell rung and you came out and you couldn't play anymore. You know, guys would look at you crazy like, dude, we got a game to play. You got a little headache and you can't play the game. Now they're trying to protect that more and, and I think that's a good thing. According to the Centers for Disease Control, over 170,000 sports-related brain injuries, including concussions, are treated in emergency departments every year. It's so much more under the microscope now, and certainly it's a different game. I played with plenty of guys that were 280, 300 pounds. I didn't play with a lot of guys who ran 4'6 at that weight. So the speed of the game has changed. And if the speed of the game changes, then injuries change, and the concussion point changes. So that's what's different. Uh, boys, one problem that we have at Penn State is the question of keeping the uh, <clears throat> boys in physical condition during season and off season. Well, if a boy takes football seriously, it is absolutely necessary that he keep in condition the year around. Back in the day, Many coaches were not against getting in condition, but they were leery of strength training. They thought it would bind up your muscles and make you tight, and you wouldn't be able to move, and now you can't run. So they were very limited, if indeed they did it at all. Toronto for the Mr. Ontario contest. And that's quite a man of muckle. My era was totally different, Neanderthal era. They didn't let you lift weights. We had no weight training. No way of making muscle bound. You lose your quickness. All these Neanderthal coaching attitudes. But it was a different time, different era. None of us can play today. Not one of us. If you brought anybody in to look like me, I fired their ass right there. <laughs> I promise you. In the late 60s, there were people lifting weights sporadically here and there across the country. And I lifted weights at a health club. And so I saw the benefits when I went to the University of Nebraska. The weight room was this small space, and the equipment they had was for injured athletes. I didn't realize it, but there were some injured football players lifting at the same time I was, and so I started helping them. And Bobby Thompson is in the end zone, a touchdown. Nebraska lost to Oklahoma the last game of the season on national television, 47 to nothing. Then they were looking for anything that might help them. And that's when they noticed these injured players that I had been working with were actually stronger when they came back to practice. And so I got a call. We went in to see Bob Devaney. He said, well, Tom feels this is important, and so we're gonna give this a try. But if anyone gets slower, you're fired. <laughs> I became the first paid strength coach in the country. Not gonna go. Touchdown, Nebraska! Here comes Nebraska with Boyd Epley and his crew, and all of a sudden you're trying to move against these corn huskers, and you're not moving, but they're moving you. <laughs> these strong, monstrous people coming at you, especially those offensive linemen. You couldn't name five other offensive linemen in the rest of the country, but you knew Nebraska's offensive line. They were rock stars. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Costa. 
Masters. Happy New Year to you. These are the trophies signifying an Orange Bowl victory and the national title, both at stake tonight. During that game against Miami, it was the best example I've ever seen of a team that was trained correctly and that one that hadn't quite trained the right way what we believed in for football. They had more talent than we did. They went right down the field and scored. Jones for the touchdown! But by halftime, they were a little bit gassed. We try to play physical football, and we're hoping that, that we'll continue to get stronger as the game goes along. In the second half, Coach Osborne explained, these guys are going to come out. They're going to be hard to stop again because they'll be fully recovered. Touchdown! But in the fourth quarter, you're going to dominate them. And that's exactly what happened. We talked about the Miami defense getting tired. Now this Miami offense is getting overwhelmed. In the fourth quarter, they went several series in a row without a first down. And we scored two touchdowns and beat them for the national championship. Nebraska earns a national championship with a tough win over Miami in the Orange Bowl. Final score, 24-17. I thought in the fourth quarter we'd be the best team, and we were. That's great. And that's what we're talking about around the country now. you got to be able to run with people, bump with people. Speed, yes, but the strength and conditioning coaches, what they're doing around the country in all the programs. I remember Urban Meyer saying that's the biggest hire you have as a head coach. College football has totally changed from a strength and conditioning standpoint. Nebraska was on the cutting edge of hiring the first strength coach, but they were also on the cutting edge in the 90s of hiring the very first sports nutritionist, which has completely changed and evolved. Every single college campus in America is building a nutrition center, and they're building these unstoppable athletes, you know, through science. Back when I played, please, we didn't pay any attention to nutrition. We didn't pay any attention to the off-season training. Nowadays, players have all the resources available to make them bigger, stronger, faster, more efficient. Mentally and physically, everything's better. Uh, here in the training room, um, we emphasize recovery and rehab as well, being able to go back and attack the next workout the next day. So we have hot tub, cold tub, normatech, just different things to make sure your legs and body is well prepared for the next day. The biggest change that I've seen is the human performance, the science of the human performance. You know, the weight training, the nutrition, the rehab, bringing people back from injury, the treatments of injury. But Vasu is hurting. Looks like it's his left knee. In fact, he can't get up right now. Team doctors out there, that is not a good sign at all. You take shots in a ball game, if they're, if they're devastating shots, you don't get up. There used to be a time when if you had an ACL, you were done. That was the end of your career. Todd Gurley has a torn ACL and will miss the rest of the season. Now they're able to operate and get people back in an unbelievably short period of time because of the training, the understanding, and just the general knowledge and improvement in medicine, period. Not just athletically, but across the board. And there you have it, a running back pick in the top 10. My goodness. The game of football is like the game of chess or war. There's a reason for every move. Various attacking methods are employed. These methods are known as formations. From the inception of football, you can trace the intellectual trajectory through the popularity of certain formations. Here's a balanced line, single wing to the right. You talk about the evolution of the game just in my lifetime. When I started playing Pop Warner football at 10 years old, we ran the single wing. Most people don't even know what the single wing is, you know, when they snap the ball back to the tailback, and the quarterback is actually a blocking back. He's through the line, into the open field. No, he's caught. But too late, it's a touchdown. Even now, all these years later, we're still talking about safety and formations. And that's what created a lot of the formation changes back in the day. The single wing was kind of brought out of that era. Barber goes into single wing. Putting your best athletic people in space so they can make plays instead of this crazy wedge or, you know, a amoeba at the middle of the field. So I think it was groundbreaking.
University of Chicago disbands its football program after the 1939 season. Clark Shaughnessy, the coach, is out of work. The man who spells touchdown with a capital T, Clark Shaughnessy. Clark Shaughnessy was a good football man, and he had an offense that he thought was going to change the game. And he installed it at Stanford for the 1940 season. The T is designed to explode for yards and touchdowns from any place on the field. Watch right hat Hugh Gallino explode through the line on this one. The same team that had won just one game in 1939 uses Clark Shaughnessy's T formation because of how the backs lined up in a T. Stanford goes 10-0, beats Nebraska in the Rose Bowl, finishes number two in the polls, and that was the genius of Clark Shaughnessy. He goes back to Chicago after the regular season and helps his buddy George Hallis install the tee offense with the Bears. Bears win the NFL title. The wildest scoring spree in pro history. you figure it. We're dizzy counting. The thing that makes the wishbone tee so particularly difficult to stop and what is the new innovation in offensive football, so it's an offense of infinite variety. When Gail Royal is at Texas, he starts implementing the wishbone. So the wishbone has the fullback real close behind the quarterback and then two halfbacks, so it's almost like a V straight to the center of the field. The idea being what we really want to do is get upfield as soon as possible. The point of the wishbone was on the snap of the ball is you had eight different options to the right or the left on the snap of the ball, and none of those were predetermined. Those were all based on reads. For the third and one, and the explosiveness of the wishbone, fullback Randy Tyler. The wishbone offense revolutionized the game for 20 years by making option football the predominant form of offense. We find that more and more teams are using the wishbone offense this year. From that early time at Texas, it caught on like wildfire and just spread across the country. Out of the wishbone, Oklahoma. And all the major successful programs in the country were running it. Southside turns it and touchdown, Oklahoma. We play a lot of games never through a ball. We put over 500 yards rushing on SC one day, Southern Cal, and beat them pretty good. We passed them one time. We shouldn't have thrown that. I wanted to be zero for zero for zero that day. There has been a tremendous evolution in this game from that time. When I first started playing and coaching, it was run the ball. It was the only pass if you had to. Toledo likes to run the football, and they can do it very well with Troy Parker, one of the leading rushers in the country. The whole philosophy was whatever team rushes for more yards, that's who's going to win the game. Toledo has won. The running game has evolved to not being as important as it was once upon a time. You still need the running game, obviously, to do a lot of things offensively, but the running back is not as important as they used to be because we got these quarterbacks and these wide receivers, especially these quarterbacks who can really throw the ball. Luke Falk made some history in tonight's game. Now the all-time touchdown pass leader in the history of the Pac-12 Conference. There's no single position in any American sport more important than the quarterback in football. If you told somebody before World War II that a quarterback was a star instead of a halfback, they'd look at you cross-eyed. After the war, with the advent of passing offenses, especially on the West Coast, quarterback became the dominant position. Think about Lola trying to make up for it. Fire to the end zone. Touchdown! Alabama wins! True freshman! The true freshman! When you look at the revolutionizing the position of quarterback, it's not just standing in the pocket and taking a hit anymore, or just checking down your reads, but the idea that the quarterback has the ability to be more mobile, it's more athletic. Inside the 20, Jameis Winston hurdles inside the 10, sidesteps a tackler, and dives to the end zone. Quarterbacks nowadays, these guys are real in tune. They know defenses, whereas in earlier years, the reads and stuff were not as complicated as they are today. You know, to see these guys doing what they're doing, it's pretty amazing. Herbert, he throws a bullet! Don Coriel. Quite simply, he put San Diego State football on the map. Coriel's revolutionary thinking provided the model for the modern passing game and brought the forward pass into total prominence in college football. 
you saw more radical schemes coming out of the West. When Don Correale was at San Diego State, it's just the idea of vertical passing, and the idea that you could build a scheme around a vertical passing game, putting this demand on the defense, throwing the ball all over the field, both vertically and horizontally. You have coaches in the 60s and 70s who are trying to throw the ball more. You get Bill Walsh and you get Lavelle Edwards at BYU. Bosco scrambles a little bit and throws. It is caught. That is Mills, and he's going to score. Touchdown, BYU. What's cool about some of these offenses is people are not prejudiced against offense where it comes from. It might come from Iowa Wesleyan, where Mike Leach and how Mummy perfected their air raid offense. Oh, yes. It might come from the run and shoot at Portland State. If you have never witnessed Portland State University football, the nation's most productive and exciting passing game in all of NCAA college football, you're in for a sports treat. So small schools have to be more innovative based on the players that they get. When you look at Archie Gunslinger Cooley at the Satellite Express at Mississippi Valley State, he was a pioneer. Because they were so outside of the mainstream, they were willing to push those ideas further than anybody else. They're introducing all these progressive ideas to the game, and then you have old school coaches like Woody Hayes who are just, you know, that's not what football is. Football is three yards in a cloud of dust. And it's a constant push and pull. Do we want football to be this manly sport where it's all about contact and this close in style and running the ball, or do we want it to kind of spread out and adopt these more progressive elements? Number 33. You look at three yards in a cloud of dust that was the Big Ten philosophy because of weather. You're not going to play the same at Miami that you do at Penn State when you've got snow up to your knees and that wind's blowing and it's cold. I coached at Iowa State. The wind will blow there sometimes 35, 40 miles an hour, so you're going to have to run the ball into the wind. The conventional wisdom was you could not throw the ball in the Big Ten because of the weather conditions in the late fall in the upper Midwest. The leading passer in the Big Ten might throw for 1,700 yards. Joe Tiller comes to Purdue from Wyoming in the late 90s and installs his spread the field passing attack. He's deep, Sullivan's got it, this is a touchdown! One play! Joe Tiller was a success, suddenly Everybody in the Big Ten is throwing for 2,000 yards. And then you get Drew Brees, who throws for almost 4,000 yards three years in a row. Drew Brees is a great competitor, and what a job he has done here today. 455 yards, but how about three touchdowns and 65 passes? Things go through trends and their cycles, but at the end of the day, running the football, passing the football, However you scheme out your defense, football is ultimately about cracking heads. And maybe you do it a little differently this time than you did last time, but to me, I don't see those changes as being structural as much as I see them being indicative of the game at the given time that you choose to watch it. And in a battle of wits, of X's and O's, if you please, they create new formations. It's an endless cycle which continues to pump new excitement into the nation's most exciting game. Mean Joe Green was a devastating defensive tackle for the Mean Green of North Texas State. Well, as far as I know, as far as I can tell, from back when I first got involved with football, the defense was always chasing the offense. For whatever reason, the powers that be thinks that everyone wants to see scoring. Look at that hole and look at the run. Anthony Davis. Oh. Defense, you're the stepchildren. And uh, it hasn't changed. It's a shovel pass in the middle. Tigers on fire. Early 20th century, there's essentially one defense being played. Diamond seven, seven guys masked near the line of scrimmage four behind them, almost in a diamond formation. The reason you had that kind of defense was to mirror what the offenses were doing. It was a running game, and here comes the ball carrier. How are you going to meet it? With the advent of the passing game, then all of a sudden, defenses had to figure out how to drop players back into coverage. So you didn't have seven guys on the line of scrimmage anymore. 
Here's the wishbone now. And then, of course, once you got them spread out, what does the offense do? Get it in tight again and throw the option. So now you got the defensive back too far back and he can't cover this guy. What does the defense do? They start rushing in linebackers on the blitz to break up your option. The offense is playing this style of ball, and the defense has to figure out a way to stop it. So once they figure out a way to stop it, then the offense has to come up with a different version. It goes back and forth like a pendulum. Norm Chown is 19 a year on the staff of Lavelle Edwards. Everyone used to play what is known as cover three. Okay, there's three defenders. And then the offense decided that if I ran four receivers against those three defenders, one of them would be open. It worked, and then the defense said, well, heck, we'll just develop cover four. Now there's cover four, and four offensive guys run down, and we got them covered. Jimmy on a straight up, good defensive drills, and it's intercepted. Defensive strategy has to evolve as the game changes, because the changes really all occur on offense. Just like the whole no huddle thing, that was a huge change in football. And it took three, four, five years for defensive coaches to figure out how do we play this fastball, man? How do we play this? On defense, we had to change complete terminology. So we would have something called Oki Short Triple 88 Six Bronco. That was, that was a call. That had to become Buckeye. Because if they're going fast, we don't have time to signal it. And the player that's getting the signal don't have time to spit it all out. So now, one word, baby, Buckeye. Call out Buckeye, and everybody knows you got to get lined up and you got to play. It's with great personal pleasure on behalf of the Sun Kiss Fiesta Bowl to extend an invitation to the University of Miami, the number one ranked football team in America. In the 80s, the key to Miami's success was Jimmy Johnson as he put it, turned defensive backs into linebackers and linebackers into linemen. Speed was all that mattered. This is the most effective way to stop any. You want the big fast players, but sometimes you got to make a choice. I wanted fast players. That's what I recruited. I wanted the 195, 200 pounder that could run like a deer. And Ellis will throw from his own end zone. Deep sideline pass tip. Intercepted. Picked off by Benny Blade. We have guys with speed, swarming the ball, playing at 100%. We were going to get after you, and we were going to make you submit to our will. We want our play and our last, our opponents on the field. And that's what Hurricane football is all about. You always have a chance to win if you can stop the opponent. So take your best players, put them on defense. Average quick slant, tip ball, intercepted by Michigan. Down the sideline is John Thompson. Touchdown! Stocking the defensive side of the ball with these smarter, faster athletes. That's something Coach Joe Paterno really brought into play at Penn State. He was awfully successful doing it. Intercepted by Penn State. Really, the main way that the game has evolved defensively, let's just be real, they've made it easier for offenses to score lots of points. And you can't touch the quarterback. Pretty soon it's going to be two-hand touch. Tag, you're down. <laughs> <laughs> that blow the whistle. Well, oh, he was tagged. The quarterback got drilled. Personal foul. Roughing the passer. Defense. The changes in the rules that have allowed for more passing, they do drive some purist nuts. All of that was rooted in safety. Oh, my God! There are sports more dangerous than football, but there is no sense that the audience the size of footballs is complicit in that. Football has expanded its audience beyond a point where these questions about the morality of the game itself can be ignored. Target for a first down to the 35. Fullware suplexes Strickland. The argument that we're having right now is how do we make this sport safer without fundamentally changing what it is? There's an argument that whatever we're trying to do to make the game safer is just weakening it and cheapening the sport. That's been an argument that's been around for 150 years since the beginning of the sport itself. But you have to try something. The game has to evolve or it dies. Look, I don't think anyone wants to go back to flying wedges. I don't think we want to do that. <laughs> but we still like to hear the pads pop. We still like to see the physicality of the game, and I think it's all still there. But I'm all for making the game safer. We just have to remember, we're going to make it safer. It just won't be 100% safe because it's football. 
I don't think that people are saying everything's perfect. People are seeking solutions to make sure football will thrive in the future. Personal foul, number 94, defense. There are so many steps that the NCAA Rules Committee has taken for player safety. They've been very proactive out of survival, in part, because they know that if this continues, no one's going to play this game. So what do you have? You have far better helmets, and those are getting better still. You've got much better concussion protocols, and trainers know how to run them. Two days used to be a staple of spring ball and August camp, and those are gone, flat out gone. They are being vigilant in trying to keep the game as safe as they can make a very violent contact sport. The biggest thing is to learn how to tackle. Don't use your head. Man, this is not a weapon right here. We do not tackle with what? Many wonder if kids should even be playing tackle football in the first place. Several states are trying to ban young children from the sport. Reports from several universities have shown that playing tackle football under the age of 12 can significantly increase the risks of brain damage. Some of the numbers are dwindling now as parents allowing young people to play football. My son's a high school coach, and he said the football team has 40 guys on the team, 40 people try out, and the lacrosse team has 100. If I had a son, I would be real leery of him playing. I understand the safety concerns, and I do think that in recent years, there are people in leadership roles who are addressing this. But to me, the idea that a generation from now, we're not going to have football is wildly far-fetched. Football looks healthy right now, but will a future generation appreciate this brutal sport as much as people do now? I think it's really hard to tell. It's sort of hard to imagine America without football, but if we were having this discussion back in the 60s, baseball and boxing and horse racing would have been the most popular sports, and football was trying to make its way into that conversation. Things change, it'll just be interesting to watch how that change affects football, and particularly college football. I happen to believe football has a great place on college campuses and belongs there. If we're just a little less ashamed of football, and a little less afraid of what it's really about, and we try to look at it a little more honestly. It brings up some tough questions about where does this game belong on a college campus? Does it have something to teach? Who are the people we should be hiring to teach it to young men? Those are good questions that we should not be afraid to look at. Here goes Bryce Perkins, hurdles a man! So college football started in the great state of New Jersey as something we would not recognize as any kind of football when Rutgers played Princeton. College football is constantly evolving. The battle we're now having about the safety of football reflects American culture. The game is violent, the game is risky, the game is innovative, the game is changing, it's ever-changing. To me, that's a direct reflection of American society, I and mean, that's who we are. You know, we're constantly searching for better. Ball throws over the middle, that's caught! Kendrick Rogers has it! It takes seven overtimes, but the Aggies do it! 